what I really want to start with is you can't run a race looking at your feet. And one time he was talking to his little granddaughter, she was trying to learn to ride a bike. And so they're out in a big parking lot, and down it's sloping, and down there there's one pole in the middle. And he told his daughter, now be careful, don't hit that pole, don't hit that pole. And she takes off, and she's having a high old time. All of a sudden she starts screaming, heading right for that pole. And she smacked it. And uh, wh why did that happen? Because her focus was on the pole. It wasn't on a good ride. Uh, he's also the one that told, told about his, uh, you know, we should have a faith like a child, the simplicity of a child. <clears throat> one time he was taking his grandkids on a, on a vacation. And they went by a place that was a nature park. I thought, oh, that'd be interesting. Let's go look at it. So they turned in. Yeah, it was nature. It was a nudist camp. And there were nude people riding bicycles. So he's trying to turn the corner around. He's telling his wife, keep your hand in front of their face. And the little one is saying, look, 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 look. He said, hurry up, get out of here. Look, look, look. They don't have their safety helmets on. <laughs> I thought about, wouldn't that be a nice kind of simplicity? But if we walk in the spirit, we can live life to the fullest or we can in We'll encounter certain things along the way, but uh, we will always overcome. So let's just wade in. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand the worlds were framed that from that which came out of nothing, which didn't appear. But uh, faith is a substance. I call it a heavenly material. It's not just some vague thing. Now, faith is substance, but it's things hoped for, uh, burning with desire to see it come to part or to happen. Not just kind of wishful thinking, but hope is confident expectation of good. In fact, faith, hope, and love are three gang members. Now abides faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love because that's the motor. <clears throat> but faith is for now. Hope is for the future. But hope is a confident expectation of good. Sometimes we don't maybe have a faith problem. We might have a hope problem. Because hope is confident. Expect it's going to turn out okay. It doesn't matter what it looks like. But faith gives us the evidence, the title deed to the property of things not seen. Uh, I think I mentioned to you, one of the biggest come-ons in the whole Bible is in Luke 15, 8, 18, 5. And uh, <clears throat> this widow, remember, she was troubling the unjust judge. She wouldn't give up. She wouldn't back down because she wouldn't take no for an answer. And he said, yet, verse 5, because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest she continually coming, she wearies me, unless she drives me nuts. This woman won't back off. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night? <clears throat> You're not bothering God when you hang on laying hold of a promise. He likes it. But he knows, too, if we're going to grow in grace and knowledge, we have to have our faith tested there's a trial of our faith, and it might be five seconds, it might be five months, but the only time we lose is if we quit, because faith is substance, things hope for evidence. We have the evidence, don't cast it away, okay? <clears throat> um, but here's the verse 8, the one that really got me. When Jesus said, when I come again, when I return, will I find faith in the earth? Will I really, will he really find faith in the earth? He's, he's got a big concern, you know. He talks about the end of the age where many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. Uh, people without the spirit will hate one another and all this kind of stuff. He's not just talking about the pagan world out there. He's talking about the mess the church gets in if we don't learn to live by the spirit. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, in... Ver in uh, Verse 17 there, he said, uh, well, let, let's go down to verse 18. Uh, 
Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, excuse me, that's Matthew 16. When he challenges Peter, who do men say that I am? Well, you're Elijah, one of the prophets. Peter, who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 16. And then <clears throat> down to verse 18, he said, also I say to you, Peter, he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. What rock is he talking about? He's talking about the rock of Revelation. Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Uh, verse 19, and I, and uh, let's go back to the latter part of verse 18. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so this is to the one who will take faith in God. But in order for us to have that, we've got to get revelation. It can't just be up here. Somehow or another, it's got to get to here. And so we're a tripart being. So I'm going to show you a graph here of how God created man. This is a... a if I had printed that, I, you wouldn't be able to read it. So Evelyn, I pulled on little Evelyn to do this for me. So this first graph, kind of little, but uh, I think you can see it. We're a three-part being. We're body, that's the outer rim. We're soul, that's the inner, and we're spirit. Now the body is the world conscious part. The soul is the self-conscious part. The spirit is the God conscious part. And by God's design, he intended for the spirit of our life to be the master. He intended for our soul to be the servant. And he intended for our body to be the slave. How many know the body makes a wonderful slave but a miserable master? How many know the soul is a wonderful servant but a miserable master? The reason the church is in trouble we're trying to operate out of our own mind, out of our own flesh, when we have the opportunity to be led by the Spirit. So this is really what I'm going to develop, and I'm not going to take long to do that. Uh, but the body is the world conscious part then, okay? <clears throat> the soul is, the body is the feel, taste, touch, see, hear. I have those around the rim there of the body. The five senses, the body, Okay. The, um, the soul is your emotions, your reasoning, your mind, your will. That's what makes you, you. Uh, we're all different. Actually, we have DNA in our body that makes us different. But in our emotional makeup, every one of us, we have a mind, a will, a reasoning, emotions, but none of us are alike. We have unique giftings. And so it's a wonderful thing if we understand how this thing works but uh, the spirit is the God conscious part. The spirit is where revelation comes, where intuition, where anointing and direction. That's all of the spirit. So let's, you can uh, take that down for now. Let's just move on because I'm going to, uh, we'll put the second graph up while we're at it. <clears throat> now, if you can see that arrow, I, that's a flow arrow. And to the unregenerate person in the world, the flow is from the outside in. When God intends for it to be from the inside out. So uh, if we're of the world, I shaded that in the middle, the spirit. And I literally could have put it black. Because the Bible said the unregenerate man, his spirit is cut off from God. He's hitting on two cylinders rather than three. And uh, the... Uh, that one scripture, Ephesians 4, 17. Let's, let's go there. I've written it in there, but it's too small. But let's put it up on the screen. Uh, Ephesians 4, 17. I want you to get this because I'm building on something, okay? <clears throat> Here we come. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God 
because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So the unregenerate man, the Bible said he's alienated from God. He's cut off. So I would, if I was going to, that circle, inner circle is just black. Okay, it's not been ignited. It's not lit up. Um, so the second graph, you know, unregenerate man is fallen man, not born again. The flow is all from the outside in. <clears throat> How many know if the Holy Spirit didn't have overall uh, control of the earth, we'd be doomed, every one of us. So, uh, he, he, you know, God limits what can go on in the earth, even if you're a non-regenerate person. It's not carte blanche for anything to happen. Uh, so I just want to make that clear. And not everybody who's in the world or unregenerate or hadn't accepted Christ, they're not all uh, bad people, per se. They just haven't had the light turned on. That's why all of us are due to the work of an evangelist. Uh, how many know people, some people out there need to know, is there anybody anywhere who's not falling apart at the seams, unraveling? Is there anybody out there that doesn't need a doctor or psychiatrist? Uh, because we need to be witnesses onto this world of what this gospel is all about. So when we're talking about the world, we're not talking about dirty sinners. We're just talking about people that are not, if they're not in the kingdom, uh, they're of this world. And uh, But here's what really hit me last night. I, I don't even know if I dared say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's some worldly people, non-believers, who act and fare a lot better than a lot of Christians. Uh, it's, it's just true. Uh, Jesus told us what to look for at the end of the age, and, and men are going to hate one another. He's just not talking about the world out there. Christians are going to turn each other in, revile, and speak evil of one another. And so much of that is going on, it just boggles my mind. If, if you've if you got odds against somebody, work it out as best you can, but that which you can't, commit it to God. It's not our job. We're not policemen to run around and expose everybody and... and uh, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't want, I want everybody to make it. Why would I want to see somebody fail? And why wouldn't I pray for them? But if you, we're talking about non-believers here for a minute, but uh, some of them act better than Christians. The human will is a very powerful force. The will is an amazing thing that God gave us. And... Uh, there, unbelievers have, a lot of them have a lot of measure of goodness. They're not all dirty, filthy sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So everybody needs Jesus. When all the dust settles, our righteousness is as filthy rags. But that doesn't mean there are worldly people that do want to do good. They just need a light turned on. <clears throat> um, there are some who are totally depraved. Depraved, just Gone. And so there's all that mixture that's out there. Uh, eventually, all that are outside of Christ are going to get done in. But look at 1 John chapter 2, 15. Don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's not people. It's a system of the world, okay? Uh, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... Let's just say money, the lust of the eye, sex, and the pride of life, power, is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of the Father abides forever. So, those are three things that are going to eventually get anybody who's outside of Christ and if we're in Christ, but we're not in the Spirit, it's still, we're still vulnerable on subject. I'm going to touch the third graph in just a second. But I want us to have an attitude of this world that God had. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's not sitting up there with a sledgehammer just ready to crack everybody over the head the minute they mess up. Now, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that world out there, we're not here to condemn the world. We're here to reach the world. But th their spirit is dark and alienated, alienated from God. So they're, at best, they're hitting on two cylinders. 
Some are doing a lot better than others. Okay? <clears throat> now put the third graph up there. This is carnal Christians. Okay? Uh, the flow is still from the outside in. And the, a lot of unregenerate, a lot of regenerated people who know Jesus are still living by the flesh, because the, the Holy Ghost is not operative in their life like God intended for it to be. So I'm going to show you in just a little bit how that flow needs to be reversed. But we're still talking about see that arrow going down, the flow is going down downward instead of as it ought to. Uh, carnal Christians are. Uh, destined for a whole lot of trouble and the flow is still backwards but revelation is a life-giving thing for all of us without you know a, a, even a christian who doesn't have the flow of the spirit this part of me plays okay that outside part this part of me uh, how, did, how did i get that one part of me plays this part of me works and this part of me goes to church, but ne'er the twain shall meet, okay? So a Christian who has not got that, the spirit, of, when you become a Christian, that spirit gets ignited inside of you. And the spirit in every one of us is just the same. But if the spirit's all locked up and bottled up inside of us, it does no good to the world. And eventually we will be done in, even though the light is inside of us. But here's a scripture just blew my hat in the creek when I got understanding of it. Uh, <clears throat> go to Romans 7, 21. We're, the third graph is up there, right? Okay, yep, we're talking about carnal Christians. Uh, a lot of well-meaning Christians try to live life, I don't, I don't, I don't, I won't, I won't, I won't. And then the very things they wind, don't do, they wind up doing. Like Paul said, the wretched man that I am. But Romans seven twenty one, <clears throat> I find then a law that evil is present within me. We're talking about believers. The one who wills to do, uh, is the, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, to my spirit. But I see another law in my members, warring against that law the law of my mind, and bringing into captivity every law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And then it hits him big time. Praise God, it's already been done. So, um, so we all know the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak, okay? We can all agree that, agree that the battles we have is mind battles. And sometimes we want to do good, but we wind up doing evil because uh, the, the mind takes over. Uh, Philippians 3.3 3 says, put no confidence in the flesh. Uh, worship in the spirit and put no confidence in the flesh. But graph number four, let's put that up there. Okay, you see that arrow? Which way is it heading? It's coming out of the inner man purpose of that inner part of that person flowing out to the outside world. But here's the mystery of it that, that got me. And I'm sure people have preached this, but I haven't heard it. But look at Hebrews 4.8. Now stay with me. Um, this flow is vital. If this remains bottled up inside of us, it does no good, especially to this world. But look at Hebrews 4.8. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore remains a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered into this rest has himself ceased from his own work as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Let anyone, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Now, this is it right here, people. Verse 12. 
For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. So we've already talked about the spirit is the God-conscious part of us. That's where revelation, uh, insight, uh, godly intuition, all of that comes out of the spirit. <clears throat> so here's the key right here. If you get this, you're going to be way, way ahead of the game, especially in the day we're living in. The word of, is living and powerful. Say that with me. The word is powerful. Okay. And it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Where that circle was cut off on the inside, the word comes down to that point between soul and spirit. But here's the understanding I had for years that really was not good. I thought that meant the word come down to further divide the soul and spirit, to further alienate that spirit from the soul so that it don't get contaminated or dirty or whatever. No, no, no. The word came to, to tear a, make a tear into the division line between soul and spirit. In the Old Testament, only the priest could go into the holy place. If anybody tried to go in there, they'd be stricken dead. If the priest didn't do everything proper, he'd be stricken dead. And they had a rope tied to him because nobody could go in and get him. They'd had to pull him out. And that blanket between the spirit and the soul was a thick blanket. Nothing but, you know, there was no outside light. Actually, the outer court had light from the universe, which is like the man, okay, like the uh, flesh part of us but the inner room was light from candlesticks that's like the soulish part of us that's a part of us that decides to worship and the soul is very important i'm not saying any of that's not important but the soul is what really makes you you that what distinguishes you from everybody else but the spirit the ointment in the spirit has to get out but don't get out we're doomed <clears throat> so this the word is quick and powerful to the piercing of the division of soul and spirit, not to further alienate it, but to tear the wall down. When Christ came, went to the cross, the middle wall of partition was torn down. From that point on, there was access into the spirit realm. Now the high priest didn't just have to get to go in once a year with doing everything perfect. Now every one of us go in. We can live in there. So the ointment of the spirit is what needs to come out of us. But if that wall is, is still up and it's, you know, the, the word didn't come to make us more, dis, uh, distinguish it more, it, it, to tear it down. So when, when somebody sees you, they see the spirit of God. Every part of you, the part of you that works, the part of you that plays, the part of you that worships, it's, it's all the, the Holy Ghost flowing out of you. I shouldn't tell you this, but one time I was driving down Jackson Boulevard and I must have cut in front of this guy. I didn't notice it, but I had uh, and I, I had come to the red light there and I saw a guy jump out of his car. So I hit the lock button. And he come running up to my window and he jerked on my handle. And thank God that I'd locked it. And then he looked at me and I looked at him. I know this guy. He's a Christian. We have fellowship together. And he was madder than a wet hen. He was going to do me damage. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. There's an ointment in here that needs to get out. And when men revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, for his name's sake, we just bless them. We don't bless them with a brick. Say, God bless you. I'll pray for you. I think you must be having a rough day. When I got to the church back then is when I had an office here, and I got there, I called him up. <laughs> he said, oh, Gary, I'm so sorry. I said, listen, man, I'm so sorry if I cut you off. But we're still friends, right? And I forgive you. And he said, oh, please forgive me. So there was a good ending to that story. But 
How many Christians are still bottled up and choked off and they want to do good, but wretched that I am because I don't have the ointment flowing out of my spirit. So let's just talk about that for a little bit. So the flow is reversed, okay? Now out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. What would happen if every one of us walked around uh, not depressed and beat down and sorrow like pickle juice, but what if we walked around just saying, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going through a battle, you know, and uh, the trial of your faith is precious to God, so we're all going to go through stuff, and it could be pretty prolonged sometimes. But if we don't let it get us down, when people are watching us from the world, they're saying, look how that person's standing. Man, I don't know if I could take it. And then all of a sudden, when you think you're at the end of the line, God lifts the lid off and the, and the release comes. But then, you know, what turns me on is what I get what I'm believing for. What turns God on is how we stand in the middle of the trial. Amen? I think I'm preaching good right now, lady. <laughs> Thank you for that clap back there. You can do it anytime you want. <laughs> Let, let's... Uh, I'm not going to keep you all day this time. I'm trying to learn from these young generation about preaching short messages in the day when attention spans aren't like they used to be. I think I'm getting there. I don't know. Gareth, you're, this guy's going to preach next Sunday, so we're going to see if you, you pulled it off once. I'll see if you can do it twice in a row, okay? And then Brother Carl's building on some stuff. But here, so let's, let's just look at a few scriptures. Jude 20, 20 and 21. Faith is not static. Faith requires exercise. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. Don't jerk somebody's door handle. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Uh, I need mercy because sometimes I don't do everything just right. But we're a mercy extender, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, this, this passage gets me. This chapter gets me. Uh, that's the love chapter. And we're not going to read it all. But I rarely preach 1 Corinthians 13. When I do, when I've done it, I don't think I've preached verses 2. Is it 2? 3. I haven't preached that very much because I don't understand. I didn't understand it. I understand it now. So look at 1 Corinthians 13. Let's read 2 and 3, first of all. <clears throat> Though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I'm zero. Though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor. I thought, how could you say that? Somebody who does all their goods to feed the poor, they got to have love. Well, a Pharisee doesn't have got to have love. A Pharisee can stand in the street corner and say, uh, look, uh, you know, I fed the poor and I did all of this and want men's applause uh, to be seen of men. So not everybody who does all mercy stuff does it for the right motives. A lot of people can, will do it for self-aggrandizement for themselves. Look at the next one. This one really got me. Though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Man, that one rattled my little brain. I finally got it. Do you know there are religions that if you sacrifice yourself to, to uh, Muhammad or whatever, you'll have a thousand virgins throughout all eternity? So there are people giving their bodies to be burned today, not because they love this world that Jesus died for, because they want to have a cushy life for the rest of eternity. So now I get it. Though I uh, bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Look at verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, strutting around like peacocks. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. 
does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things. Now, here's we're talking about faith to live by, okay? Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. And love never fails. That's from the ointment coming out of the spirit part of us. Man, if we keep that flow going in the right direction, you talk about a world that's going to be ignited by Jesus. And I think all that's going on in the world today, those that come through this knot hole that aren't paranoid and just falling apart at the seams are going to have such an impact in this world because there are people who desperately need Jesus with skin on. And we're it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're it. Don't poke them real hard. You can poke them, but not real hard, okay? <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We must live in the zone of godly confidence and godly security. That's faith to live by. I'm good to go right now. I might be going through a battle. I might be going through a struggle. But I'm okay because he's okay. He's got my back. You hear that a lot, don't you? There's somebody got your back that's tough. That's the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but I was thinking, you know, Jesus came to this world and gave his life as a sacrifice. I'm thinking the Holy Spirit, he could have said, God, he would have said, he could have said, after, they did, after what they did to Jesus, I'm not going. <laughs> but here he is. And he's here to empower us and to quicken us and to infuse us with life and compassion, the heart of Jesus to a bankrupt world. You are more important than you think. And it's not because of how much money you have. It's not because of your status in life. You might be a wealthy businessman. You might be pretty impoverished, but you are somebody. God's not going to throw you in the ash heap. God's getting ready to use you big time in the end of the age because the greater, he said he saves the best till last. God's getting ready to move this world. And in your sphere, you have influence in your sphere. And as long as you let the ointment come out to the out flowing outward, instead, don't let ever let it turn inward, because if you do, it's an ugly thing. So don't do it. Hebrews 10, 35, we're going to close this. Don't cast away your confidence. Verse 36, you have need of endurance. Verse 38, the just shall live by faith. That's my title today. Faith is a way of life. It's not just something you crank up because you're sick or something needed. I mean, thank God we have faith for that. Faith is a way of life. You walk every day in total confidence. Not because of your circumstances, but because of who you know. So I, I just want us to get it this morning. I, wa I want you to get the picture of you're a tripart being. But what business are we in then? Luke chapter 4. The spirit of the, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, upon you, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. How many know the church is not intended to be a referral station? You know, we have a nice meeting on Sunday, and then I'll see you next week. No, church is to be operative all, every day of our life at all times. Godly encouragement is the oxygen of the soul. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Then you can encourage others. Faith without corresponding actions is dead, the Bible said. Faith without actions is dead being alone. What, what kind of actions? Corresponding actions. If you're believing for something... Uh, Confess it. Make the good confession. And if you have to be like the woman that driving that judge nuts, drive him nuts. Just say, Jesus, I'm hanging under your pants leg. And I'm not backing off until I get what I, you promised it to me. And I'm not going to quit until I get it. We think, oh, Jesus thinks that snot-nosed kid shut his mouth. No, he's saying, Father, there's my boy. Father, there's my girl. They're getting it. And they, I, they didn't just pitch a fit and I threw them a sucker. They're pitching a fit. 
because something's agitating them on the inside, and they're not going to quit until they get it. Oh, Father, aren't you glad Jesus is at the right hand of the Father pleading your cause in heaven? Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit is at the right hand of your soul on earth pleading the Father's cause in us? So Jesus is saying, Father, there's my boy. Bless him, honor him. And the Holy Ghost is saying, Father, get him. They're out in danger zone. Don't let them fall over the cliff. He, he's here to convince us of sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit's here to tell us, as long as we're flowing in the right direction, it doesn't mean you're super saint the day you got born, but it does mean if you're going in the right direction, the Holy Spirit is convince you when you're heading down the sin alley. He's going to say, no, no, don't do that. It looks good, but it's going to hurt you. And then he says, by, by the way, you are righteous. You're in right standing because my champion, the one that sent me, made it through on your behalf. He died that you might live and have life more abundantly. So the Holy Spirit's here convincing us of sin. Don't do it. Righteousness. What's the third thing again? Judgment. We're all going to stand before the judge of the universe. Put your faith in action. What are you pointing at, fella? That girl's supposed to clap one more time or something, right? <laughs> well, I'm done. If I did this under 40 minutes, I get a badge. If I went over 40 minutes, tough.